uh, enough of a break? If not, too late now. Ha ha. <laughs> Sorry, that's my uh, maniacal evil scientist laugh. Anyway, uh, this afternoon we're having our second informal education and public outreach session. Uh, and uh, we're going to start with a talk from Laurie Petacolis, who I will introduce in a, a second. And that'll be followed by uh, a panel or a panel discussion, actually mostly Q&A, so be ready to ask us questions uh, about how to do outreach to underserved communities as you know, an eclipse is obviously a great way to introduce people to science in general. Uh, and then there'll be a break and we'll have uh, a, another um, couple of breakouts uh, shortly after that. Okay, so let's start by introducing our plenary speaker for, for this session. Um, so uh, Dr. Laura Petacolis is currently the Associate Director of Education of the Education and the Public Outreach Group at Sonoma State University. Uh, for research, she has, did her PhD studying Aurori uh, and apparently does this on both Earth and Mars, which is awesomely cool. Um, Prior to being at Sonoma State, she was a senior fellow at the Space Sciences Lab and was director of their education group known as Multiverse. And the thing that is uh, that she did and is most known for during the 2017 eclipse is that she led the crowdsourcing effort known as the Eclipse Mega Movie, uh, which if you don't know, brought together over 50,000 photographs to try and get some more science out of the, uh, at the eclipse. And with that, I'm going to let uh, Laura take it away and tell us about the many facets of Eclipse Outreach. Okay, thank you so much, Angela. It is a great pleasure to be here today, two years before we get another total solar eclipse and um, a year and some change <laughs> with the, the other one, which will be wonderful too, but I'm a little partial, not partial, haha, -ha, total. <laughs> Uh, I'm partial to total solar eclipses, but then that doesn't really work, does it? In any case, I'll stop with the silliness. Um, and instead I will get to talking because I really do want to make sure that we have time to have some rich discussion in our plenary. Um, so I will be talking about the many facets of eclipse outreach. I am simply going to, um, First, thank all the people who have helped me on my journey um, in STEM education, science, technology, engineering, and math um, education. I couldn't have done it without this long list of people and especially for the Eclipse Mega Movie project that um, Angela mentioned that we undertook in 2017, which was um, a huge undertaking. We took five years to figure it all out and my main message of this whole talk is to collaborate and partner with people. And I'm, we'll say more about this, but I mean people like your children, um, your spouse, families and friends, uh, Sonoma State, the university you're working at. Um, basically, if you're in my life, ultimately I will invite you to collaborate in STEM outreach. And I hope that you can say the same when you're doing your own STEM outreach um, or if you wanna work with other scientists. <clears throat> so just, I couldn't do any of this work without all the amazing people that I get, get to work with. So here's some of my main messages. I'll give you very concrete examples of um, how I've done some of this myself. And uh, I'm going to push you all to venture respectfully and cautiously outside your comfort zone. So we have an amazing opportunity again <laughs> and again um, to engage engage the public in this really phenomenal experience of a total solar eclipse. Um, and it's also a great time for us to grow as grow in our um, professional and personal lives. So that's what I'm asking you to do. And I'm asking you to do that um, by thinking about who you might want to partner with um, for these eclipses. So consider family and friends or colleagues who work outside the astronomy and physics um, arenas. 
So if you are in the astronomy and physics areas, then look outside of those, um, look outside of that network that you have. Uh, if you are in another field, uh, if you're a teacher or you're a um, really a, a manager of, of events, um, then you probably, you also should be thinking about outside, you know, who, who can you connect with outside of, of the people here today? Um, what connections do your friends have within their communities? Uh, who are your colleagues in different fields than you're in? Um, do you have trip? Like I go to trivia on Thursdays with an English professor, uh, two English professors and um, uh, a colleague of mine who works in a different program here at Cinema State. And we've started talking about various things, cross disciplinary ideas um, for our outreach, uh, STEM outreach. So that's just an example of what I mean there. Consider locations or communities who may be left out. So you, through this whole, la the last two days of this workshop, you'll, you have heard and will continue to hear about communities that people are reaching out to and working with. Um, I urge you to think about who haven't you heard of yet? Where aren't we going to be? Um, and try to reach those areas as well. And ask yourself who in your network could help you connect to these communities. So one way you can find um, great partners is uh, by NSF funded uh, groups. So NSF has uh, tons of educational um, uh, and outreach, education and outreach, efforts that they fund. It's under the Directorate for Education and Human Resources. And you can go to this, the NSF, um, either a simple search um, uh, for awards or they have an advanced uh, search where you can look up awards. You can put it, so I put in the, um, I put in a keyword eclipse and I came up with all of these different projects, 43 that um, NSF has funded. Some are science projects. So if you're looking for a scientist, that's uh, one way to find one. Um, if you're looking for educators who've already done this type of work, then this is one way to find them. Uh, likewise, um, oh, so here's an example for the Eclipse Mega Movie. Uh, the Crowd in the Cloud it was a citizen science, big data, and democratization of science research project. Um, and it it involved creating um, videos, movies, really, little documentaries. And so one of their uh, documentaries was about our project, uh, the Eclipse Project. And so they they went and interviewed some of the um, volunteers who took who got trained through the Eclipse Mega Movie Project and made an extra um, that was part of their project. So that's an example. Um, NASA also, the NASA SCI Act uh, funds a lot of education groups and um, here is their website. And again, you can go there, there's a Teams page, Science Activation Teams, and you can find the P principal investigator or PI or co-principal investigators and um, reach out to them. So for example, oops, what happened here? Here we go. Um, for example, um, this just happens to be one of the projects that uh, we're involved with here in Sonoma State. Actually, Professor Kaminsky, um, the director of our group, leads this project, and the audience is neurodiversity, neurodiverse um, teens, or specifically autistic teens. And we will be funded during um, the total solar eclipse, and presumably we will be engaging autistic teens. So if you work with autistic teens, uh, reach out to us and you can find us on that previous website. So there's, but I, we're not just, we're one of over 27 different groups being funded by NASA to do things. So it's not just us. I'm sure you can find um, people who have a great network through that website. Um, so my next, last, kind of my final part of this plenary before we get to our panel is, um, I don't want you to underestimate the idea of a cold call. But cold calls without collaborations or you're using your networks, your friends, your family aren't as effective. They'll take a lot longer. So, but they can be incredibly effective for pushing you outside of your comfort zone and finding new places and new people who may not be um, aware at all about the eclipses coming up. So of course you're building trust and friendships with your family. Um, although these days, I'm sure if your family's like mine uh, with the political situation that may be 
challenging, I urge you to keep those friendships up if, if it makes sense. Uh, friends, neighbors, community members, and um, you know those who are coming from a different culture than yours. Maybe you are an extrovert. Go find introverts. Find out what, what they think about eclipses. If you're, uh, um, anyways, we'll talk more about that at the panel. So leverage your combined networks and the internet to find others who might be interested in joining your intercultural collaboration. Uh, make phone calls and send emails with information about your project, leveraging network relationships. And visit those who respond to gauge an interest and build a common plan. So this, these are very concrete steps that you can do tomorrow. It's Sunday, probably not tomorrow, maybe next week. Uh, this is a, a, a picture of our, um, one of our, the mega movie team early on and we're, we were hosted by Google partners. And in fact, we met um, this team uh, because a, uh, we were partnering with our, um, one of our kind of famous astronomers at UC Berkeley, um, Alex Filipenko, and he had stopped teaching in order to get funding for Lick Observatory. And in that he had made cold calls and he had found some people at Google who were really interested in astronomy. And so when we were doing the Eclipse Mega Movie Project, we went to Alex Filipenko and we said, Professor Filipenko and said, you know, hey, might you introduce us to those folks you met at Google? <laughs> and sure enough, that led us to actually partnering with them. And I'm still meeting with Calvin um, right here, and he's very interested in this, but they're, they're more in a quarterly kind of time frame, so they'll get interested in about a year and a half. <laughs> so um, new audiences. Uh, here's another example. Um, so the total solar eclipse path in 2017 went through Oregon, Nebraska, North Carolina, and South Carolina. And I pick out those four states because I had relatives in each of those states. So what a great opportunity for me to go visit my relatives and interact with their community. And I did that. I used my family connections and they helped me a lot to, um, and you know, communities feel a lot better listening to what you have to say when you're part of their, them. So that helped. Um, I also have this dear colleague of mine, Nancy, Dr. Nancy Maryboy. She's um, Navajo and Cherokee or Dene and Cherokee. And she had great connections to the Cherokee community in North Carolina. And so we did a um, intercollaboration, an uh, intercultural collaboration in, uh, about the solar eclipse together. Um, so that's another example. And I think, this is my last slide. So um, my tips for cold calling. So um, we made cold calls about a year out um, and we ran out of time. So without all those collaborations, those collaborations were possible. Um, what I, this, this, if this um, outcome was possible because we were leaning on the relationships we have professionally and personally. When we are trying to reach people that we didn't have that connection to, then what I'm, okay, <laughs> all my clicking is not working here. So I'm just gonna summarize by saying, you need two years to forge new, par new partnerships. So you really need, if you're gonna really re push yourself outside your comfort zone and reach out to folks who you haven't reached out to, then you need to start that now, okay. So that is all that I have to say for now. Angela, do we do questions now or should we go right into the panel? Um, I suggest we go into the panel because I think it's, you know, that they're going to be some of the same questions that uh, are going to be addressed. And it would be good for people to, to meet all our panelists. Uh, shall, I, shall I start with introducing the panelists and then let them speak? Yes, that would be wonderful. Okay. Where did that bit of screen go? There we go. Sorry, too many windows. Um, <laughs> it's like, oh, where is it? There we go. Okay, uh, so next we're, we're gonna hear from uh, a, a bunch of panelists. I'm just gonna introduce them all and then I'm gonna call on them each to do their own little introduction. Um, uh, obviously we've already, uh, I've already introduced Laura uh, and uh, those of you paying attention in the chat will have seen some of the comments from me and you already met me more than enough times over this last two days. Um, so let's start with uh, um, uh, Trey Winter. Uh, he's a solar astrophysicist uh, who's worked on a bunch of NASA missions uh, related to the sun, but 
Uh, he's also developed the Eclipse Soundscapes project, which was aimed at engaging uh, visually impaired folks in uh, the 2017 eclipse, and has since co-founded the Arisa Lab, uh, which is aimed at making science more accessible. We also have uh, Derek Pitts, who you may have heard from earlier in the day. Um, he is currently the, the chief astronomer and director of the, the Fells Planetarium at the Franklin Institute in Philadelphia. It is in Philadelphia, right? Um, <laughs> and, um, and he's also been a NASA solar system ambassador for over a decade uh, and notoriously has been on the Colbert Report, which is just, you know, talk about reaching a different audience. <laughs> Um, and so uh, he comes with uh, a completely different set of expertise. So, uh, and then we have uh, Cody Klein, who is a graduate student at UT San Antonio uh, and is Navajo Ordine, uh, and is gonna be sharing some of his experiences and understanding of, uh, of native cultures. Um, okay, let's start with, uh, with Trey. No, we're going to start with, um, with Derek, sorry. Oh, are we? Yeah. Okay. I'll, I'll let you lead then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so Der Derek's up first. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Uh, good afternoon. Thanks for having me again this afternoon. Uh, let me just share my screen here because I have a couple of slides. Uh, I I'm going to try to do my best to save time because a lot of um, what Laura mentioned it happens to touch on a lot of the same sorts of things that I would have mentioned also uh, in this idea about connections. Uh, let me see, there we go. Uh, so in, in this idea of connections, what I wanted to talk about it relates to how to approach these audiences that you may not have worked with before. And I'm thinking specifically of community audiences, very much like Laura is speaking about, but the points that I want to bring out, I'm going to try to shift a little bit uh, to be a little bit more specific and speak about uh, one and underserved audiences for our institutions, which tend to be the least represented uh, visitors to our institutions. These are, uh, these are audiences of color, people of color. And in the experiences that I've had working with these public, with these community audiences, here are some of the points that I found have been really useful for me to make connections with these audiences. Find someone you know to connect with. You can figure out through your network who it is you might wanna to connect to in a particular audience. You have some connections somehow, you just have to figure out who you might be able to tap that can help you make a connection. As Laura said, start building your connections early. It's important to get the connections built early because often these audiences do not trust us coming from a science institution. Uh, the lack of uh, connection with science institutions has, has created a, 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 a gulf that is sometimes difficult to try to abridge if you're trying to do something quickly. So it's important to start building those connections early so people get to know who you are and what you're, what, what you're all about. Uh, begin the programming early. What I mean by that is if you're going to start your connections early, why not see if you can begin some programming early on before the actual big event takes place so that people can come to know who you are. And in that same vein, you need to collaborate and not dominate. And what I mean by that is rather than going into a community and telling them what you're going to do for them, you need to find out where that community is in their programming and what they want to do they don't want you to come tell them what you want to do for them. What they want is they want a partner and they want somebody that respects and understands what their goals and objectives are. So you wanna coordinate their program often, you wanna coordinate program offerings with their objectives. That way it feels like a partnership. Now I've had particular success with faith-based organization youth programs. And you know, interestingly, I'm not a church guy particularly, but I realized that there was an audience of youth programs that wasn't getting any connection because they happened to be part of the faith-based organizations. So the connection I found happened to be the Office of Faith-Based Initiatives for the city of Philadelphia. I happened to build, build a connection with the guy who was running that office. And what that did for me was it gave me an entree to so many of the uh, church programs where I could reach through him to make a connection. And I ended up having a number of really great church connections 
for science content. Now that has all sorts of other issues and ramifications connected to it, but it worked out really, really well. Now I also put in my note here, you know, you can also reach out to individual science teachers. You've probably had plenty of experience with this before, but it was one of the things that worked out really well for me is rather than going through our school district, nothing against the school district or against the board of education or anything like that, but I found I got much more traction if I went through individual science teachers because often the science teachers are connected to someone in a community-based organization in an, in an audience that I want to reach that I haven't been able to reach any other way. And these are trusted connections that can help to introduce you to an audience. And then one of the other things I think is really important is staying connected afterwards. You know, you don't want to drop in and do the helicopter thing where you pop in, do this program, get all your kudos out of it, and then disappear and never be seen again. So I really, really recommend that you consider this uh, part about staying connected afterwards. That's it for me. Thank you very much. I'll stop sharing my screen and on we go. Okay. Uh, next up, we have Cody. Okay, let me share my screen right quick. So, yet a shay could cly and shed this lany than snow to get Lini Bush's team with Annie Dasha Che, with Annie Dasha Nalikut Ego than initially. Um, what I just said was my introduction in Navajo. Um, every time we meet new people, we introduce ourselves to them, tell them who we are. Uh, so, what I said basically was hello, my name is Cody Cly. I am of the Mountain Cove clan, born for the Water Flows Together clan. My maternal grandparents are within their covers clan, and my paternal grandparents are within their cover clan. Um, this is what makes me Diné or Navajo. Um, I'm currently a student at University of Texas at San Antonio. There's my email if you have any other questions. Uh, so what I'm going to be talking about is just the Diné perspective of viewing solar eclipses and what it means to us. So in Navajo, what a solar eclipse is called is or So the first one means the death of the sun, and the second one means just it's in between us. So it's just describing the moon and what it's doing between the earth and the sun. Um, eclipses, it, eclipses to the Navajo or Diné people, basically it's the death and rebirth of the sun. Uh, to us, the sun is known as Johanna'e, um, or the one who watches over us during daylight. Um, so things we do during eclipses, so the time to reflect, plan, spend time with Ke or family, I just said, um, which is family. Um, oftentimes we'll, we'll pray just to let the sun know we're still here. Um, there are chants that we're once saying during eclipses inside the Hogan. Um, I have not heard any of these chances, chants in, my, chants in my life before, but there are some people who know these chants and hopefully we can find them. To, hopefully they can share it with us one day. Um, are things we can't do during solar eclipses. This is such an intimate time between the moon and the sun. Uh, we, out of respect and reverence, we don't eat, we don't sleep, we can't drink any fluids. Um, another big thing is we can't go outside because during this time when the earth gets dark, um, it was also observed that animals stop doing things as well, but we also believe that there are evil spirits roaming about outside. So that's just, that just ties into our spirituality as Diné people. So it's a whole nother can of worms having spiritual spiritual imbalances so looking at eclipses this affects us spiritual spiritually mentally and can have physical reper, repercussions um it moves us away from the ideals of what we're taught is hajon, which means um balance or harmony within ourselves and at the same time we also know physically if you look at the eclipse at the wrong time it, it will hurt your eyes you know you can they say you can go blind from watching eclipses so that's some of the literal senses we had with these traditions so yeah, um, those are some beliefs. If you have any questions, um, I can post my email in the chat and you can email me with any further questions about Navajo, Navajo cultures. But when it comes to reach out to Navajo communities, it's usually best to go to what we call chapter houses. So those are just like centers where like the local community can come together. Um, the Navajo Nation is such a, a, big, a big reservation that there will be regional differences between these beliefs as well. So this is just what I've been told. And so we are an oral, a lot of our traditions are passed down orally. So that's why it varies from region to region on the reservation. 
Thanks, Cody and Craig. Hello, everybody. Uh, so I am Trey Winter, and as mentioned before, uh, I am a co-founder along with Mary Kay Severino of the Arista Lab, and we have uh, several different uh, Eclipse uh, projects going on uh, for both the 2023 and the uh, annual Eclipse, 2024 Eclipse. And I put a bunch of links in here where you can follow those projects. I don't feel like you've got to copy all of those. I just pop them all in the chat as well. So please feel free to follow all of our projects there. Everything works great when you practice it, but no, it doesn't work in real life. Anyway, so um, what ERISA stands for is the Advanced Research and Inclusion and in SEAM Accessibility Lab. Uh, I'm a former astrophysicist with the Smithsonian Astrophysical Observatory. And when I was there, uh, I worked on a bunch of uh, public facing projects, but I noticed that most of them weren't very accessible to a lot of people, including people who are blind and low vision and 2017, uh, offered us a great uh, chance to engage uh, with a lot of people with the eclipse. And NASA had a mission of engaging underrepresented groups, traditionally underrepresented groups with the eclipse. And I made the case that there is no uh, greater unrepresented groups than people who are blind and low vision and was able to make uh, a mobile application called the Eclipse Soundscapes app uh, in order to make a universally designed a learning project so that everybody could use it to engage with the eclipse. And so one of the things that people think is that this is something for people who are blind and low vision. It's like, no, this is something that's for everybody. But we started the design process with people who are blind, low vision, so that we can make something that was um, useful for them and starting with that population and working with that population so that we made something with them and not for them meant that everybody could use this together and enjoy an eclipse together. And so those are the, that's the real message is you know, very much making with, not for thinking about which groups might have the hardest time accessing your information and starting with those groups first. And instead of making that something that you try to tack on to the end because that hardly ever works. Um, and this is, these are some images uh, from one, the top ones, me using what's called the rumble map. Uh, that was our way to sonify eclipse images. So you can trace your finger across images of uh, different uh, eclipse features. And you actually feel this rumble from your uh, speakers making these specially designed tones so that you can actually hear uh, what's going on underneath your finger and build up your own mental map of what these features look like. And we found that this is not just useful for people who are blind, low vision, have no other, no other way of accessing what that might be like, but it's also another way to engage a lot of different learners and everybody loves playing with it. Uh, it part of the universal design is that we had multimodal instruction of every part. All of these eclipses are both described in text and verbally using what's called descriptive, um, illustrative description of images, which is a technique that was developed by the National Center of Accessible Media, one of our partners, it actually uses language that I help craft as a scientist, but then they refined so that it, those uh, words had meaning to people who had maybe never seen, uh, had been able to see before in their entire life. And we we're very proud of this. We had uh, 55,000 uh, users on the day of the 2017 eclipse of the app. And then we had another 76, oh, we've had now a total of 76,000 downloads and uses of the app uh, since then. And we think that we have post eclipse use of the app because it's really the only thing, the only app out there that's really for people who are blind and low vision to uh, gain access to astronomy. NASA Heat gave us some funding to update the app. So it's now in review. Uh, we've added annular eclipse information and uh, we have our uh, Eclipse uh, Center page uh, on this image as well, where it actually counts down to the next eclipse and it's counting down uh, to the annular eclipse. And you'll notice that it's in Spanish. Uh, one of the things that we added for the 2023 and 2024 eclipse is bilingual functionality. Okay, 
So for 2023 and 2024, we want to do something different. Uh, for 2017, we made something that actually described an eclipse and was very much designed to, uh, so that people who are blind low vision can have two-way conversations about the eclipse, not just having people tell them what the eclipse was. Uh, but now we want to take that one step further. And we want to make an experience that everybody can participate on equal footing to actually do science based around the eclipse and experience the eclipse in different ways. And there's a 1935 paper by a guy named Wheeler uh, that uh, tried to describe how animals changed uh, their behaviors during eclipse and just have people write it down. And so now we're using citizen science in this new uh, field of study called soundscapes ecology to, order, to record how animals change their behavior during an eclipse using uh, the sounds that they make in their soundscape. So we have citizen scientists that are going to be actually recording the data and actually, you know, determine where they're gonna put their recording devices, what animal uh, sounds uh, they might hear, or even human sounds and human reactions to the eclipse. Make a scientific investigation of that. And to do that, we're using uh, inexpensive recorders called audio mounts, but we're adapting them so that they're accessible for people who are blind, low vision. I could talk more about that. But we're also uh, doing data analysis as well. And so what we're working on this year is actually refining our data analysis tool so that anybody would actually be engaged with listening to this data and determining what's changing, and whether they're sighted, blind, or even deaf. So that's the Eclipse Soundscapes project. And lastly, uh, these are all NASA funded. And so NASA loves to have numbers. I'd like to know their outreach, their impact. Are things like this effective? Are me talking about these things effective? Uh, so we have uh, a brief survey that I would love for everybody uh, attending this to actually uh, take. It will take you less than five minutes. It's all anonymous. Uh, you can either uh, scan the QR code here or you can uh, copy the URL, uh, URL and I'll also put the URL in the chat too so you can do that. So if you would just take like five minutes real quick and just fill that out, it's just really basic information. Uh, and it helps us uh, continue these projects and constantly refine them. So thank you very much. Thanks, Trey. You can leave that up there for a few seconds in case people are trying to open their scanning apps because you know how that works. Um, <laughs> okay, so I think last up for uh, the, this to talk about what's going on in this panel is uh, me. Um, and so just to kind of uh, talk about reaching out to different groups, and there have been a few things uh, going on in the chat, but just so that because you may have missed them, um, you know, during the 2017 eclipse, I basically talked to any audience that wanted to hear me um, and frequently ended up doing things that were completely unexpected, um, including talking to the Bonterre uh, Correctional Facility, which is in, uh, was in the path of totality um, in Southeast Missouri. Uh, it's also one of the places where executions happen in Missouri, which kind of freaked me out. Um, this was actually not through my own university, but through St. Louis University. And they approached me and said, would you like to do this? And I'm like, oh, heck yeah. <laughs> uh, and it's a completely different challenge, but it was, I would say the most engaged audience I have ever had, ever. And I've done a lot of outreach. Um, and, and I would absolutely love to do more of that. Um, I think that you've got an audience who is starved for entertainment, um, but also uh, a lot of the, I mean, the, the number of questions that I had on things like um, general relativity, because there are a lot of people who have nothing to do but read books. And so, you know, they're educating themselves and now they've got someone that they can ask all these questions they've always wanted to ask. It was amazing. Um, there was also some discussion in the in the chat about uh, assisted living, um, and I would also strongly recommend that. I did both the sort of assisted living that's uh, sort of people at the um, post retirement end of their life, uh, as well as the sort of assistant assisted living that's more uh, physical and mental disability issues that put them in those sorts of um, environments and both were very gratifying as well um, and I also gave a talk in a 
uh, a shelter for women who are victims of uh, domestic violence. So that one was actually kind of tricky because you know they're trying to make sure that I'm safe to invite and know where this place is and stuff like that. So that was kind of fascinating. Um, so you know, just in terms of a different sort of audience where you may you may get someone that you wouldn't expect suddenly excited. I think Derek mentioned churches. I would say churches really are an amazing way to reach an audience that may not voluntarily come to a science talk, but once, you once you're there and talking to them, they're fascinated. Um, and most churches these days have computers and screens. And so it's real easy to just take a PowerPoint in and do a talk. Um, and then, um, you know, one of the, there's a couple of places that I did, that are, you know, I don't know whether they're underrepresented groups, but, you know, breweries, that sort of thing. I even got a beer named after me, as you do. Um, and, uh, and then the one that um, we're actually going to be doing uh, here in San Antonio, but I tried to figure out how to do this in Missouri and, and didn't manage to do it. And that was uh, reaching out through, uh, through the military. So uh, in, in Missouri, there was a, an annual air show that was always on Memorial Day and there were always a lot of military folks. There was a lot of recruitment done through those things. Um, but the person who ran it was absolutely adamant that unless we were part of the military, we couldn't be part of that program. However, I'm now in San Antonio. And for those of you that don't know San Antonio, it is very, very military oriented. Um, and we actually have a lot of uh, military and ex-military students at, at UTSA, um, but we have Joint Base San Antonio and they have an air show in two weeks. And we will have people doing outreach at that event, not necessarily about the eclipse yet, um, although we will have some material there. So that's another space where, especially an air show that's militarily oriented, you're reaching out to people who wouldn't necessarily uh, again, go to a science event, they wouldn't necessarily go to a museum, but they want to see the planes at the air show. And so you have access to an audience that you wouldn't ordinarily um, get to you know, interact with. And so you get these nice accidental things. The, the last thing I'll mention, and this is more on the networking front, so picking up on what both Laura and, and Derek were talking about, is giving talks to American service clubs. So think Rotary, Kiwanis, all of those sorts of uh, clubs. In fact, the Lions do a lot with uh, people with um, vision issues. There's, you know, they all have their own uh, areas that they're interested in. Kiwanis does a lot uh, with K through 12. So in doing talks to those groups, you build up those networks and it can end up with connections that you never expected. Um, and so that's more of a, it's usually a fairly broad base of participants who have fingers into pies that you would never have thought. Um, and, and that can really help you get into different places. And I'll stop talking and let's see if we have any direct questions. And if not, I will uh, synthesize some from the comments in the chat. Questions? Yeah, so just to remind folks, I think we're doing the raise hand as well. Oh, yeah, that's right. Uh, Laurie? You're still muted. Just one second, I have to reactivate participant oh. unmuting. Okay, Laurie, you should be able to unmute now. Thank you. I think you remuted yeah. yourself. <laughs> Okay, let's try this. <laughs> um, hi from Victoria, BC in Canada. Thank you very much for, um, for uh, having this. It's been uh, really terrific. I would like to ask Cody um, if there is um, uh, anything being done, if, if he knows uh, through the Native Sky Watchers and Annette Lee, whether or not any programs are going to be done through the, in the next couple of years. Um, for uh, for some of the populations up in um, up in that area, I don't have any knowledge at the moment. I can reach out and ask. Um, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Adele. 
Uh, yes, I'm, I'm just wondering, you know, because I've heard like the, you know, I've seen the partial eclipse before. I haven't seen a total eclipse. It's kind of like maybe getting a Happy Meal is a partial eclipse and going to Disney World is, is a total eclipse. I'm wondering how we can frame the this this dichotomy with pe people of uh, under. I think we lost Adele, but I think the question was, and, and hopefully she's not completely gone, uh, but I think the question was essentially, um, how do we convey the idea of the difference between partial and total eclipse uh, to underserved groups? And I'm not sure that it's much different than conveying it to everybody else, but I let other people weigh in on that idea. Um, I'll just say that um, part of the reason we were doing the Eclipse Mega Movie was to get people to go under the under totality because of this challenge of communicating how important it is. Um, but of course, that's not always the best approach. I just want to emphasize: it's. It, I had lots of people say, "I don't want to spend that hour to get to totality." When they lived in like Eugene, Oregon, all they had to do was drive the teenagers they were overseeing 20 minutes um so i think we just have to i i just want to say it's a real challenge <laughs> may i offer a suggestion i i tell people that uh, a partial eclipse is listening to a song you like on your phone a total eclipse is sitting in front of the stage at a live concert one of them you will always remember and the other one was kind of cool but nowhere near the real thing Thanks, Doug. Okay, uh, let's see, uh, Dan? Yeah, my qu general question is, uh, what are some of your, uh, everyone's favorite events to do outreach at? And this doesn't have to be the traditional one. Uh, I know from personal experience, uh, doing hands-on science activities at other festivals has always been a huge, huge help uh, at concerts, at basically wherever people are. Uh, actually, at our last stakeholder meeting, someone even volunteered to start being at our barber shops to get people excited. Uh, so I was just kind of curious what some of other people's favorite places have been. Nice. Well, I'll start and then I'll let, oh, Derek, go ahead. I know you're going to laugh, but uh, wine tasting seemed to work very well for me. There are added benefits. I'm sure you see what I mean. Uh-huh. I need to get invited more to the places that you go, Derek. Um, <laughs> I'd like to see if I can arrange a bourbon tasting during this. Um, I will say that uh, during 2017, we worked a lot with a, a bunch of libraries in Nebraska. Um, we actually did some professional development uh, work with teachers. And I really thought that my role was to try to very much like educate uh, educators to try to extend that outreach as much as possible, right? Um, because I, I wasn't gonna be able to see everyone or everything. Um, so, you know, try to get like people who knew how to reach their audiences in touch with all the information possible. Um, it was mentioned uh, before, and I'll just say, again, I did give a, a talk to a retirement community and they were so involved and so on point. They asked me questions that I didn't even know because they had been researching this for like a week right before, before I showed up. And they had like extremely specific questions and they were really looking forward to that. So I think that is a, a great unreached population uh, that we can also uh, work with. And again, you know, RISA doesn't just make things for people who are blind low vision. We try to make things that are accessible for everyone. And that's another population where they might not have, you know, access or, you know, might not have, you know, might be harder to see through telescopes. So trying to think about how you can design these experiences so that, you know, more and more people can actually engage with them and be in, uh, have fun with it. So uh, those would be a couple of my suggestions. Really don't, don't count out like retirement homes. They really love this type of programming uh, very much. Laura? You know, my favorite outreach town halls were at rural community centers. And 
you know, you walk through the town and there'd be very few people kind of walking around and then we get all the chairs set up and then the community would just show up and you just have all these different people. I just love that so much. I just thought it was really fun to just see the community come together. So, so Cody, did you want to add anything? Uh, most of the time these eclipses happen, I'm always working. So it's just like spending time with coworkers, just watching them and just kind of explaining, so. Yeah. Derek? Can I just clarify that I don't do science outreach only at wine tasting. <laughs> <laughs> it's all the other things too. And I, I think I would say that um, I was just typing this into the chat, but one of my favorites uh, has been the faith-based audiences, mostly because the audiences seem so grateful to get the information that someone would reach out to them with science content. And so that's why that's like number one, then it comes to science festivals and senior programs like Trey was saying, thanks. So now I'll just add, uh, this is more along the lines of what Dan was saying, but things like uh, open air gatherings. So um, the, there's a, an art festival every year in Columbia, Missouri. So we actually started the Artful Science Tent um, as part of that festival. And um, then also farmers markets. Um, we, we actually did the, the pre-anniversary, the year before the 2017 eclipse, we got comp to stall space. So we were selling uh, merch, including the viewers, uh, but we also had solar telescopes out and we were just preaching. Um, and that environment where there's lots of people there that are there because they're into art or they're buying vegetables or whatever it is that they're doing and they're not expecting you there and that you sneak up on them essentially um and so those have been the most fun for me i would also say as i had kind of intimated before the 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 presentation i gave in the prison was amazing and i would totally do that again Okay, let's go to the next question. Spencer. Oh. Uh, yes. The Last way question. I was the way I was working for the 2017 is I sort of wormed my way into a uh, radio show that was syndicated all over the southeast, and they would give me five minutes on like Tuesday morning to talk about science, and I would just slip a clips into that. Now, that's 2017. We've come a long way since then, and there's this thing called internet radio. And I'm sure that most of the people here could probably squeeze themselves into some internet radio show that you know of or some podcast that you know of and be able to do just about the same thing to uh, get the word out for the total eclipse. Thanks, Spencer. I think that's a great idea. Um, actually, we are out of time, and I want to make sure that we have time. I believe we have a break now for actually 13 minutes. Um, and so the next session is going to be two more breakouts. Um, I'm going to leave you with that image just because I can. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, and go and, that's take great. and <laughs> come back in, uh, in 15, no, 13. 12 minutes now at 3.30 Eastern. Um, and we'll have two more breakouts. Uh, one is uh, more about resources and stuff. Actually, I'll be good and actually show you what you're supposed to see. So send, send me a can of that. <laughs> I still have some. Um, Angela, I think we are reconvening at 25 past. So you need about eight minutes for the break. Oh no, okay, all right. Yes, we are indeed. Um, so the two breakouts are essential resources for education. So that's going to be a bunch of NASA stuff. Plus, you've already heard from Michael Zeiler, Fred Espinak, and, and Dan McGlone you have not heard from yet. Um, and then we also have outreach to museums. So you'll get to see Derek again, along with Michelle Nichols, Mitzi Adams, and Alison uh, Bierlia. I have no idea how to say that name. Sorry, I am probably butchered it. Uh, go do whatever it is you need to do for six minutes and we'll see you back. Bye. And the yeah, time, please the love chat. the survey for NASA. Oh, yes. Do the, do the survey. 
And Thank just you. so everyone knows, you need to go to a different URL for the breakout rooms than you do for these plenaries. And, and Claire has put them Claire. into the chat. Correct. So they are in the chat right now. It's the breakout one and breakout two. Oh, and Laura put them in the chat too. Angela, there's a question here from Ke uh, Kevin. Will be will we be receiving a certificate for CE? I assume CE is continuing education. I don't think we have any plans for that right now, right? Not at the moment. If you have further questions, Kevin, you can reach out to one of us, and we can see yeah. if we can sort something out. All right, everybody.